fun. Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good day, good solstice, and welcome to Richard and Carl Presents Deep Space and Dragons. I'm Richard. And I'm Carl, and uh, I mean, like, solstices uh, don't exist in space, so, so uh, like, uh, you, you should uh, feel honored that uh, our our uh, space station is is being brought to your ears from a place where we can recognize your, your lunar calendar. A solar calendar? Hey, Both, I, I, I think, suppose. no, because solstice, you just need equal night and day, so as long as you're orbiting around a star somewhere, you should be able to have a solstice. Or if you're on a space station, you deliberately set so there's 12 hours of night and 12 hours of day, you're just living that solstice life permanently. <laughs> well, I've always kind of wondered, because part of what causes the equinoxes and solstices in in uh, on Earth, I guess, is the fact that the Earth is on, on a uh, tilted axis, the right? And so that's what causes the seasons and what causes the days to lengthen and shorten. Um, but if you're on a planet that doesn't have a tilted axis, uh, does that mean that the, the seasons don't affect that planet? Well, there's so many other <laughs> factors that cause our seasons to exist in the first place that... Oh? Well, think about it. If you move slightly too far north or slightly too far south, you don't actually get noticeable seasons. Also, our planet has to have water and be in a temperature range that it can freeze and then melt to change the weather patterns based on where we are around the sun. The fact that seasons exist mm. might be a solely Earth phenomenon, because we use plant metrics to determine them. Like, basically, mm. the trees tell us when the seasons are, and then we just made everything else up to go along with it. <laughs> like, Saskatchewan doesn't uh, but, even uh, have fall. <laughs> it just has two winters. <laughs> It has warm-up winter and actual winter. No, no, Saskatchewan ha ha has fall. It's just that's the day the leaves fall off. No, they stay frozen then, then to the winter. tree and they come off in sheets of ice. <laughs> hey, man, enough about seasons. Uh, what's new with you, Richard? So, unfortunately, at the time of this recording, my beloved Mr. Miko is having some tummy troubles, so I've been trying all day to feed him with an eyedropper and outsmart him. And eventually it resorts to me putting individual drops on his paw while he was going to groom so the dumbass would lick it off the back of his hand. <laughs> so in our battle of wits, I think I'm winning this round. It turns out eyedroppering liquid into a cat's mouth is not the most easy task in the world. So hopefully he starts feeling a bit better tomorrow now that I've successfully mm -hmm. tricked him into licking the medicine. But if not, I'm off to the vet because... Quite frankly, Miko is higher on my social hierarchy than everyone. Fair enough. So, in less tr deeply tra self-tragic news, what's new with you? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know how many of our, our listeners are familiar with the uh, anime slash manga Black Clover. I'm going to say 200%. Uh, but it has about... <laughs> it has about, uh, about 320 chapters or so, and I've spent the last couple of weeks... Uh, because I've just been looking for content to to peruse and, and read, uh, and uh, I was like, eh, you know, it seems pretty popular. I'll I'll just uh, it keeps coming out new and stuff, so uh, I'll just give it a read. And I I finally uh, caught all the way up to the latest chapter. Oh, nicely done! I remember when I tried to do that for One Piece, I failed. <laughs> you know how fast I read, but sometimes you just like there's human at human physical limits. To how much catching up you can do. Yeah, I, I, I feel like if something has more than 400 chapters, uh, catching up from the beginning is, is just not worth your time. But congratulations on that. And with that note, let's head into tonight's episode on... Jojo! Or more accurately, Dio, and that show I guess other people are in. Starring Dio <laughs> and his ability to spite somebody... <laughs> throughout all of the generations. We may also drop a reference what? or two to other generational stories, but the main focus here is on Dio and his legacy, and his son, Gio Gio. <laughs> uh, his mysterious son. Which, okay, so, I mean, um, do you know, because the Shonen Jump app is, is how I read most of the manga that I read, um, and for whatever reason, the uh, re-releasing uh, 
JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 5, Golden Wind. Uh, they're re-releasing it um, in, like, chunks, kind of seemingly randomly. So they're only up to, like, Chapter 50. Um, and so, you know, uh, the main character, uh, Giorno, I believe his name is, something along the lines. He's, he's Italian. Um, but uh, Just pause for he one moment. is Dio's son. Just to be clear, we are about to try to explain JoJo starting at part four, which may be the poorest choice in history, but we need to commit. Let's do this. <laughs> well, okay, so Dio is it's an evil vampire, uh, no, and uh, no, the, side, the stop, start of the stop, story stop. in part five, at least. No, 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 no. Hmm? He's not an evil vampire. We need to be clear about this. He is evil and also a vampire. The fact he is a vampire has nothing to do to how evil he was, and may have made him a little less evil than he was as a person. I just need to get that on the record. Dio's the kind of person who finds out you have a crush, and then assaults them in front of you, so that way you don't get to kiss them first out of spite. Also, he kills your dog! And that's how he treats uh, yeah. his family that takes him in. He is the worst. Yeah, kill... Kill, kills the dog, poisons the poisons the father, tries to steal the estate. Yeah, this is how uh, he treats Gio the people was... he likes. <laughs> uh, and, and then ultimately, uh, he steals the original JoJo's body, uh, which is which is where my question comes in. Um, so Giorno, uh, who comes in, you know, several generations, or well, I guess it's only one generation later because he's Dio's son. Uh, but or four generations later, if you really think about it. Anyway. Um, is he, um, like, a combination of the Joestar family and Dio because Dio is using the Joestar body? Like, is that uh, is that ever really explained, or is that just, like, So, the chain of events is... Hand-waved. Jojo the First manages to hit Dio with solar-powered hyper-martial arts and explode his body. But Dio chops mm -hmm. off his own head, manages to kill Jojo while just being a head on a platter, and then stitches his head onto mm -hmm. Jojo's body. He then absorbs right. the blood from Jojo's grandson Jojo while fighting off against Jojo the third, fifth to then fuse his body to Jojo's body. So I think at that point, his son would be like, because he's like fused his body that was stitched onto Jojo's body. So I think his DNA mm. would be like 50-50 Dio Jojo. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, stylistically, uh, he is definitely the, the JoJo that looks the least like a Joe Star. Uh, I mean, that's because he's actually also a uh, Dio Brando. It's true. Although he's probably never, never... the least Jack Joe Star. <laughs> but, uh, but the, so that that's uh, part five is the one that I I don't know that much about because it isn't actually released in its entirety. On the uh, on the Shonen Jump app, and generally speaking, uh, I find anime to be uh, very time-consuming to watch, and uh, quite often there's just so much like yelling and screaming and filler that it's like I would rather just you know have one panel of Rawr! and then move on to with the story fair, as opposed I need to, to like point this out. five minutes. Famously, in part four of JoJo's. There's the Aura, Aura, Aura chapter where he does 18 pages of the character screaming Aura repeatedly and punching somebody. <laughs> so someone being punched for 18 pages translates to them being punched for 22 minutes on screen. He got Aura, Aura, Aura <laughs> for... Uh, anyway. So... <laughs> An entire episode. <laughs> <laughs> As intended. Wow. As intended. Uh, uh, but so... <laughs> Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, uh, I I really really do uh, enjoy. Um, like so, so, the first part one is oh, just straight up a gothic horror. Back when it made sense. So the first part of part what? one. Oh, we kind of glanced over this, but go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, like, I I really. <clears throat> so, uh, like, I I don't know if we've mentioned this on on stream or not, but I asked you, Richard. Or you asked me, Richard. You're like. Uh, if I was going to release a, uh, if if you were going to release a weekly book, what kind of book would I want you to write? And and I said I said horror because I, it's not something I generally read, but I, I often find myself enjoying, uh, horror horror uh, content. I don't really like like slasher horror or like uh, like gore 
or like I don't like Saw. Saw is not good horror. I don't think. It's just self-mutilation is awful. Yeah. But more to the point, uh, part one of, the, of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is quite squarely uh, gothic horror based on the setting and the content uh, because it's it's set in Victorian England and uh, halfway through the story, the main villain Dio uh, becomes a vampire. Which yet again, I'll still like, argue, made him less evil. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, then when it comes back down around to part three, where Dio actually shows up again, uh, he has the lamest evil plan ever in part three, because his plan is literally just to rest and relax till he's recuperated. To be fair, his part three plan, you don't actually see it pay off till part six, and it has payoff. <laughs> you, so... To go a little further into the JoJo lore, and this line will feel like spoilers, but you'll never actually see it coming, even if it's explained to you. Effectively, Gio, mm. Dio's plan works out in such a way that he's able to send his disciple slash boyfriend back in time to break original JoJo's spine. <laughs> okay, so Steel Ball Run is is, uh, is the offshoot where where Dio manages to break JoJo's spine. Yep, which I mean, there's some commitment to the bit when you post more than 50 years later, get your vengeance. Not on the guy that defeated you, but on his grandfather whose body you stole. <laughs> Again, so Steel Ball Run is, is also, that's just not posted at all on, on the Shonen Jump app. Oh good, it's too much, uh, man. So, I'm going to tell you, like... As we go through JoJo's Bizarre Adventure in our seemingly random order, at the end we'll have to make sure to sequence what each part's about so you can truly grasp how absurd the following sentence is. The plot of Steel Ball Run is a horseback race across the western United States so the President of America can collect the bones of Jesus Christ to give himself superpowers to open a portal to summon Dio. Oh. Wow. And uh, it's vaguely implied that the original Dio became Jesus. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> but yeah, so, so I, I, I super enjoyed part one because it's, it's a gothic horror. Uh, I absolutely hated part two. Really? Uh, like, um, so the part two Jojo. Uh, is so part one Jojo. I guess I should go with, start with. Uh, he's a very noble, compassionate, and honorable guy. And he is a uh, way of the sun soul monk. Right, but part part two Jojo. Uh, if he was going to be a monk, he would be like a, a shadow monk. He's all like sneaky and underhanded and and uh, rude. Um, and so I really, really enjoyed that the the same um, character design, but with the opposite personality. But once the novelty of, of that uh, switch happened, wore off, um, part two tried to be pretty much exactly the same story, but just like just like more, you know, oh, and now instead of fighting one vampire, he's fighting three vampires. Not just vampires, super vampires brought to life with Nazi fungineering. Well, I, yeah, I mean, at, at part two, uh, I felt like it was going the way of, like, the Fast and the Furious franchise, where it's like, part one is this down-to-earth cop trying to solve a, some sort of, like, crime ring, uh, and then, you know, it escalates to the point where now they're sending... Uh, but Jojo still trying does to tell actually the same story. uppercut the main villain into space by using a <laughs> volcano behind his fist. That is how part two canonically ends as he uppercuts the main villain into space <laughs> as a volcano blows up behind him. So, uh, that might be the so most I... Fast and the Furious thing ever. Like, <laughs> that's the notable conclusion of where that action movie tropes go, is using a volcano to uppercut a vampire into space. But, yeah, it, it's just like, so part two was, was just part one, but more. And I, I just... It didn't really feel like it added anything new or problem, interesting to the story. I think its biggest problem is they introduced the part two villains as we made the mask that made the part one villains, but the part two villains, because they were just evil, possibly space aliens, much like the secret final boss of Naruto, 
It was, oh, mm -hmm. so part one, we had this story of we brought in this kid, Dio, after his, we, his father saved my life, even though his father scammed us. He was trying to kill my father for the inheritance and then became a vampire in his attempts to kill me. And then I had to hunt him down and fight him in the castle. That's that's a good hero villain dynamic is my dick pole foster stepbrother who's been trying to screw with me my entire life. I finally decided to get jacked and punch him in the face. I can get behind that motivation in plot arc. But part two, the villains are just kind of there. And the protagonist is also just kind of there. And they don't actually have a motivation against each other. Uh, yeah, um, and then, uh, <laughs> is one of the other problems that I had with it was that, uh, it tried to stick so close to the original story beats, uh, like the, the Zeppelini plot point, uh, which as far as I can tell, doesn't come up again, uh, after part two. Uh, but the Zeppelini guy, like in part one, there was a, uh, a heartfelt self-sacrifice that helped Jojo actually, you know, defeat Dio. Uh, in part two, uh, it felt like he self-sacrificed himself because that's what the, the plot said he should do, not necessarily because he had a compelling reason to do it or a compelling way to do it. I honestly think part of it might be they didn't take it far enough, though. Because as I mentioned, if you want your part two to be part one, but you've changed the setting, you've changed the characters, but want to hit the same story beats, it could have worked if there was a compelling villain. Because if there was a villain that they were actually connected mm -hmm. to, like let's say the villain in part two was actually Zeppelini's son, like instead being his bromance and sacrificing again, the part two villain was caused from the ramifications of part one. There would have been some satisfaction mm. to the story beats and it would have gave it a clever twist. Because interestingly enough, right. Part 2 JoJo is actually my favorite JoJo for a personality. Because he intentionally downplays himself as an idiot so he can catch people in over-elaborate traps. And most of them made sense in the show's <laughs> internal logic. So I'm like, okay, I can kind of mm. get behind this guy. But he had no personal connection to the story. He was just kind of fumfering through mm. it. And when your characters right. have no emotional stakes in it, it's like, I must defeat them. It's like, why? Because they're evil. Sure, but why you specifically have to stop them? Well, you know, because I guess I'm committed now. And with, so then, but moving on to, to part three, though. So part um, three, the I, first I've, thing they I've did, heard that people say that... You Go ahead. Part three is simultaneously the best and worst season of JoJo. It is in a quantum state. Uh, yeah, I mean it, it's it's awesome because they 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 mix up the formula uh, and uh, it's also it's a, a road trip, trip movie, fun and so, interesting adventure story road a road trip movie. What's uh, interesting? But I, oh, I, I think it was. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going <laughs> to say one of the things I really liked about Part Three is in, instead of their first off, they brought back the Part One villain. It's like the villain is your. Dick Hole Foster Uncle who stitched himself onto your great grandfather's body. That is a reason for you mm. to get out of your chair and solve this world ending problem. That is a worth your life reason. Mm. But as it did completely mm. departure from the structure, it was Villain of the Week, which I've gone on record to hate. But you watch them road trip across the country, and weirdly, the secret fourth mm -hmm. character in part three of JoJo's is the fact that he actually went on location to all these places to have his road trip bromance among his four bro trope. <laughs> so it's like... Uh, well, see, I, I definitely think that part three was really awesome, but it was made weaker by the fact that it was JoJo. Like, um, it would have been a really fun and interesting and unique story to tell. Uh, but then he connected it to Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, but then severed all the ties to the previous two seasons. Because what happened was, he hit intellectual bank... I'm not going to say intellectual bankruptcy or create a bankruptcy. That's a little harsh. But he hit an issue of... The superpowers he made for Part 1 were, these are specific anti-vampire superpowers, and they let you do very specific mm. things. In Part 2, he'd used up everything he could think to do with them. So Part 3 is like, you know what? Right. I'm going to completely flip the script and go about completely different, unrelated, not at all connected superpowers. And I I almost feel like it, that was an editor push. 
and it's the thing mm. is, part three didn't get payoff for it. But if you start the show at part three, parts four, five, and six, and to a lesser degree seven, get immense payoff from that switch. Because they switched it to a system that was less, I channel sunlight to punch vampires, and more weird, mm. basically free license to Flex's artistic creations. Like the fight in part six where they use cloud suits in a vacuum and rain poisonous frogs on each other. <laughs> Uh, but but so uh, according to the JoJo's Bizarre uh, fandom wiki, um, it was originally planned to be uh, a trilogy, according to the wiki, which uh, is a little bit like it's, it's really strange looking back now because because uh, it's such a huge departure from the first two seasons, uh, but and and then like he succeeded. Seeds in, in defeating Dio. And then the story just keeps going on and each subsequent season is like a, is just a, a different genre with these superpowers just stapled onto it. Well, that's kind of what's interesting that's both good and bad about it, though, is... So you get to part three and it's super mixed. A lot of people have it as a lowest rated one because he didn't quite know what he was doing. He was... A lot of mm. the rules of how it functioned was being made up on the spot. And as I right. mentioned, it got a little villain of the week. The bromance road trip angle might not be perfect. But once mm. you start getting to the later parts and they start using it as a device to tell more self-contained stories, people often think that part... Mm. It's always between four, five, or six for the best one. But if it weren't for three, you couldn't have four, five, or six. Not because of chronology, but because they're what set up the foundation for it to even be possible. It's kind of like well, see, the Phantom Menace. No. <laughs> <sighs> you were about to say the something, Phantom and Menace. then I'm like, the Phantom Menace, because I was going somewhere with that. So, oh, well, you, you can go ahead. You probably have something more interesting to say than I, than I did. Oh, no, please. I want to know what your comment was before I deep dive into Star Wars. Well, I mean, I was just like... Uh, so, part one and part two... Well, part one is a gothic horror. Part two is just a mundane, regular horror. Uh, then part three is like this uh, road trip movie, villain of the week style. Then part four turns into like this like s serial killer murder mystery. Right. Uh, then part part five is like a, a, a mafia movie. And, and then part six is a prison break. And it's just like... Uh, I really do appreciate how bizarre and varied the story gets, especially when he starts jumping from genre to genre, but just adding and his own not... twist with the, these uh, stand powers that he introduced in part three. Well, what's interesting, too, is they're not a little jump into a genre. They're not genre hopping because a season of JoJo is the entirety of a lesser series like <laughs> part four of JoJo. You're like, oh. Part four of Jojo, yeah, yeah, like 20 episodes or not. No, part four of Jojo is the length of the entirety of Full Metal Alchemist. Each part of Jojo, <laughs> you can fit an entire Full Metal Alchemist in. These aren't short shows. And they, like, some uh, of the newer parts are, like, even longer. I'm like, wow. He's just like, yeah, you're genre hopping, but he's not genre hopping. He's like... If an author went off to do a completely different series, it'd be like if J.K. Rowling, when she finished Harry Potter and started doing murder mystery, kept it taking place in Harry Potter. Which is an insane <laughs> decision. Completely ludicrous. But create a truly iconic series because of this. Uh, yeah, it, it's like one of the best-selling uh, mangas of all time. And also, they he's also completely unwilling to compromise for some... So this started in the 80s, and you can watch a shift where all the anime had similar art style to JoJo's in a way, except maybe Dragon Ball. And then you watched as the... Mm. Uh, how can I say this tactfully? The body pillow movement resorted in more female characters, less muscly male characters, and for a while in the 2000s and 2010s, everyone was pretty. Like Kira and his sister mm. were visibly identical, and their gender was distinguished by the color of their mobile suits. <laughs> right. So it's like they went into this big, they call it the Moe art style, big eyes, round features. And if you look at JoJo, there's not a single round line on these characters. Like their hair isn't even round. It's just like, <laughs> I'm made of spi 
I may be 16, but I'm more jacked than Terry Crews, is the aesthetic of JoJo's. So, what's... Okay, okay. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm now, uh, uh, I mentioned my part about, about how he genre hops, and, and we've uh, gone over that, but I'm a little bit interested in your deep dive comparison be- between this and, and Star Wars. You, okay, you so, we'll start with 4, 5, and 6 of Star Wars, where if a lot of purists had their ways, episode 4 and 5 of Star Wars would be where Star Wars ended, and it was perfect and flawless, that's it, we're done here. For JoJo's, mm. it doesn't quite map so smoothly. Because JoJo's part one would almost be your Star Wars trilogy, right? Like, part one of JoJo's mm. was a self-contained vampire killing story, and then you get mm-hmm. a new, then you get the Phantom Menace for part three. You're like, what are you doing? Why do we have Gungans? What is this Jedi Council? Clone Wars, droids? You just made a whole bunch of new ideas that weren't remotely attached. And as people quietly fume mm. at Star Wars one, two, and three. They forget that that's where, like, 90% of our Star Wars content comes from. Like, that's where we get our Clone Wars animated series, all our side characters and spinoffs. Ten movies later, like, Mm. if we didn't have The Phantom Menace, arguably a terrible movie, we wouldn't have The Mandalorian now. So it's one of those things Mm. where sometimes you need to, when you make, when you're the thing that's responsible for making a huge pivot, you're going to be hated no matter if you're good or not. So part three mm-hmm. made such a huge pivot that was vital for the series, but gets hated, hated on because it was stuck between two different sides of the coin. Because part four is like, part three doesn't mm-hmm. have our complex nuanced battles. And part two is like, why aren't we killing vampires anymore? And weren't we using martial arts? And where's the vampires? <laughs> so part three is going to take a lot of flack because it had to combine two desperate parts to actually function. Well, yeah, and then, then like, part four and five, I can see why those would be would be highly praised, because, like, having read part four through its entirety, um, Platinum Stardust... I, I don't know, not, what is part four? Uh, part, part three is Platinum Stardust. Diamond is Unbreakable. Ah, right, Diamond is Unbreakable. Uh, but like I say, in part, part four... Um, it goes from being uh, the, the bromance road trip to being uh, like serial killer, killer, murder mystery uh, with like, you know, <laughs> this, the character ends up being uh, a part of the, the hero team. But like when the um, Rohan, the, yeah. the manga artist in the manga. <laughs> uh, so meta. Uh, but he just has like this creepy, like, power to turn people into books and then read them and, and write stuff over their life. And, and it's just like, uh, it still has all the, a lot of the Eldritch elements that, that made part one, uh, great. Uh, but then, uh, you know, they, they end up using their unique powers to track down and hunt a serial killer. That's giving other people powers just because he wants to like murder more people. Yeah, and then we get to part six, which is one of my favorites, because we're like, okay, we're following the main Joestar line again after just taking a break for part five. But we put mm. having it take place as a prison murder mystery kind of situation was fascinating. Also, mm. I don't know when this came out, but there could not have been very many female protagonists in Show and Jump at that point, since there still isn't any. I wish I was kidding. Uh, well, but so, it's show and jump right now. Name one uh, female protagonist. Oh, um, a female protagonist. Yep. Uh, well, okay, so like that, the kind of depends is like uh, Doro and Doron, Doron, Doron. No, I can never pronounce it. Uh, but this, you know, the uh, emotional support. That is such story. a stretch, and I'm assuming there are they. I uh, got... No, I was actually going to say, like, uh, obviously our main protagonist is is the Mononoke and, and, and the red-haired guy, who's, I don't know why I can't think of their names. Uh, I'll but, call him Dora uh, from... <laughs> yeah, anyway. But the female samurai character, uh, I mean... She, I would say, she's a protagonist, and uh, she's featured pretty, pretty heavily in the first twelve chapters. So I don't know that that's 
Yeah, but like a fair yeah, bit of equality there, I think. For show and jump, I mean, it's right in the name. You don't expect a lot of female characters to do heavy lifting, but Jolene mm. is the main character of JoJo's Part Six. It's not like a debatable thing. They're who goes on the cover art. Also, they're in a woman's prison, so other than a few characters who have snuck their way in. But what's interesting is <laughs> they let her be a JoJo still, who tells people to go fuck themselves. Excuse my coarse language for this podcast. That was a quote. <laughs> Even in high and literature classes, if someone drops an f bomb in a sonnet, if you put your quotation marks and say where it's from, fair game. Anyway, <laughs> like she's allowed to actually have tw- ten pages of oral punching someone in the face. Where often, if you put a female mm. character in something, their gender becomes their personality trait. Like Sakura and Naruto, literally, what do you want to be? A housewife when I grow up, specifically to the hot boy character on my team? It's like, wow. Wh- what are your hopes and dreams? Oh. To marry Sasuke, even though he stabbed me that one time. And told me to die in a ditch. Uh, and he poisoned me once. I, I just as a, as a random side note, I mentioned that I, that I uh, had read Black Clover. Um... But one of the things that I noticed is that uh, the male protagonists all slowly got paired off with female characters. Is that not how uh, that works? Like they're just like they're fighting together, and <laughs> it, it was just it was just kind of weird because they're they're like aloof and and don't really care, and then uh, it's like uh, the female characters like. <clears throat> uh, lower themselves to be like oh man like he doesn't care but i love him so much because he's just he's just always there for me he's like well i don't know it's just kind of i don't know why it struck me as odd but but like the the main character black clover in particular has like three different female characters that are all like oh i like this guy because he's got guts uh dating simulators i think the funniest accidental (laughs) side effect in one of those is in fate stay night because in the original game which was so the original game, you picked one of three characters to hook up with. That was literally how the game was designed to function. And mm-hmm. the thing is, since it was designed to be a silent protagonist because it was supposed to be the player, he's ended up as the blandest character in fiction because he had no personality mm-hmm. and was never intended to be animated. So you have a character that all the girls are hitting mm-hmm. on with literally no personality whatsoever. And it's just such an cl- anime cliche. It's like, I'm so into how he has no personality. Look how deeply, tragically tortured he is. You can tell from his complete lack of sending any signals. Which might just be a culture thing or what. But as a general rule, if I'm interested in someone and they specifically, when I make eye contact, look away and frown, I don't continue to pursue them. <laughs> I don't- Maybe that's what I found out odd about Black Clover was the fact that, that the, the male characters showed zero interest in the female characters and for some reason that's what caused the female characters to love them. Yeah. So JoJo's is a weird one because in part one there was no female characters. Just straight mm. up no named female characters other than the main character's love interest who basically fell from the fridge the woman trope of was very clearly there to motivate the protagonist and had no other core function. But I mean, like, <laughs> right? It was also what 1600s London. Well, and then also just taking into account the time that that it was written, yeah. Like the the more most recent, uh, the well, sorry, part six, a stone ocean, uh, it takes place in the women's prison. Uh, it's set in 2011. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the, like uh, the soundtrack to our our podcast here today is a. Uh, uh, soundtrack from the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Super Nintendo fighting game. So, like... Yeah, it was a part three fighting They're set, game. like, 30 years apart. <laughs> like, it, it's kind of kind of insane how long-spanning this, this show has gone on. Uh, and so when you when you read the, the older parts and you see that there are no women or that they only have such a small role, uh, culturally, that's just how storytelling was, was done. You know, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, especially in the genre of manga in the Show and Jump magazine. Like, it's mm-hmm. like, we're writing anime for t- teenagers. We're not going to put a lot of women in it. Although, interestingly, in part two, <laughs> JoJo's mom was actually just a badass movie star super martial artist. 
<laughs> they didn't get a ton of screen time somehow. Part 2 had a lot of good ideas that didn't quite flesh out. And then Part 3 was a bromance road trip across the countryside. And I was weirdly okay with that mm -hmm. because of the idea that, yeah, me and the guys are driving out to Cairo. Sure! Also, I'm not actually quite sure how well it would have went if you tried to do a 1800s period piece in Egypt with a female character and tried to be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> but over the course of it, you watch him uh, start in, like, yeah. actually writing some surprisingly nuanced female characters for Show and Jump. Mm. You know, because he lets them be people. That's... <laughs> lets them be people and actually do things and contribute to the plot. Yeah, uh, like, like, my favorite example is World Trigger. World Trigger actually has a pretty good balance of male to female characters. It's not that bad, except it still mm. is just straight up two to one. Just straight up. Mm -hmm. And it's like, none of the female characters rarely get to be like the team ace or get a lot of screen time. And it's just, in that series in particular, where they have 70 named characters and 20 are women and five of them are good. It's like, well, that's pretty telling of the genre more than of the series at that point. Mm. Especially uh, in series where you have superpowers. Interestingly, Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer. I think it had an exact 50-50 gender split. Hmm. I think uh, so. Yeah, Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer... I mean, we, we've already talked about it before, but, like, it's... That... It's it's kind of short but sweet. It, it's it's very well thought out. Um, Opposite of JoJo's, where, like, for JoJo's sure. Bizarre sweet. Adventure... I'm pretty sure it, all yeah, of JoJo's Lucifer... JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is, is like, the opposite of that. Because I'm pretty sure. sure the entirety of Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer fits partway in part four of JoJo's. Like, that could just be a subplot in there. Like, in its entirety. Uh, also, weirdly, with the rules of the show, I think it could happen as scripted and not have to change any of its internal logic. <laughs> but we're You're reaching the end of our right. episode, so let's give a quick JoJo's. I'm, I'm going to say the part, and you get five words to describe it. Part one. Uh... Uh, badass gothic horror story. Somehow vampires didn't make it in or England, but pretty good. Well, I would have been like it, Victorian. It the gothic horror, the, the gothic is, is Fair where enough. it's at. All right, part two. Uh, hmm, <clears throat> brass Yankee uh, gains super martial arts kind of funny because he was also the jojo in america born as an american there's just some amusement to that that the american one was specifically the biggest d-bag of the crew <laughs> jojo's part three uh <clears throat> extremely strange bromance road trip nice that was actually i like, think that was only four words but yeah but concise 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 i love it part five uh, well, you skipped over part four. Oh shit! Part four. Uh, and part part four uh, is uh, mm, uh, let's think. Searching for crazy serial killers, because there's actually two two serial killers in that in that one. The first one they get pretty quickly, but then the second one is is quite a bit sneakier, and. Uh, it, it like just as a little tangent. Oh, I know we're it. supposed to be consent, concise, but but uh, part four, they find the first murderer, and then the story just kind of keeps going, and I'm like, why is it still going? And then it turns out that there was a secret second murderer, and it was like, oh, well that makes sense. That's why it was still going because they haven't actually solved all the problems for this small town. Man, I would have my four words would have been knives out, superpowers in. <laughs> All right, on to part, okay. on to our part five, where we started our podcast. <laughs> uh, well, part five, uh, <clears throat> superpowers mix with the mafia. I would have went with vampires, bastard son, mafia story, but we're pretty much on the same boat on Ooh. this one. 
Yeah, it's well, I mean, I'm all about the superpowers. I guess they come, they come yeah, from the vampirism, but... Yeah, his vampire powers don't really give him anything. It would have been great if JoJo from that one was also just part vampire and just bit someone's throat in at some point. <laughs> Alright, on to part six. Oh, see, part six is, is being released weekly instead of in random chunks like part five on the Shonen Jump app. So I haven't actually read that much. I think I'm only on, like, chapter ten. Uh, but I guess if I was going to describe it in five words, um, criminals band together against the system. Excellent. And then I will finish this off with the far in the distant path of Jojo part seven, because I just love the sentence of vampire horseback ride to find zombie Jesus. Being the actual plot <laughs> description of anything is just beyond beautiful. And with that, we're going to finish things off with our random question of the week. Sadly, the Ragan random dragon question has been retired for now. Instead, has been replaced mm. with our soon-to-come-out newsletter. Once we split that out and you sign up, you can submit your suggestions for future topics of Deep Space and Dragons for your chance to win a free Waltz of Blaze Deluxe Edition. Digital Deluxe. But for our random question of the week... This one. Do, 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 do. If you could wake up tomorrow having gained any one quality or ability, what would it be? Any one quality or ability? Yes. Um, I would want high speed regen. All right. So I was like, my first thought when I read this question was, do I put the qualifier of like or mundane or human ability? Because like. If it's any ability, then being a level 20 wizard would be pretty great. <laughs> or the world, though, would be pretty amazing. But to give myself something reasonable in scope, I want the ability to just sleep for six hours uninterrupted and wake up well-rested. Just to declare that I get six Ooh. hours sleep and get them and wake up fully rested. Like the the elf trance from, uh, from Dungeons & Dragons? Right, like for mundane superpowers that are physically possible, that's pretty high on my list. No, if I can just have anything, oh. maybe just you know, omnipotence, whatever. But I, 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 I go for high speed regen because uh, it's not something that that would make you stand out in any particular way. But you could, uh, like, a, you know, uh, um, if you get hurt, then you just aren't hurt for very long. And then B, if you're like exercising and working out, the high speed regen would, would allow you to exercise and work out even more. So you could actually like. But I must warn you, way better than, than if you have high-speed regen, you'll be you'll suffer heroes a side effect. So in every comic book, manga, TV show, whenever someone has high-speed regeneration, that's not dynamically interesting on panel or on film or in audiobook. So I guarantee you, the day mm. you get that power, something's impaling you. <laughs> <laughs> like, the day you get that power, something's happening, so you're now aware you have high-speed regeneration. Like you're getting kicked off a building or lit on fire or just blown up. Straight up blown up. Because the number of times Wolverine would be dead uh, if he didn't have that power. <laughs> that, that's true. And one closing note, and I'll hand it over to you for that. Oh, uh, uh, well, if you're, uh, if you're interested in some... Supporting us in other ways, we do uh, have a, a Twitch stream that we do on um, Tuesdays as of the recording of this episode. Uh, you know, life gets in the way and their schedules might change, but uh, right now that's that seems to be the day. Uh, so if you want to hear more of our random conversations, uh, tune into that and you can watch us. Uh, I believe we're playing Kirby in anticipation of uh, Kirby the Forgotten Land because that just looks awesome. Oh man, this video is going to age so poorly if that game somehow ends up being terrible, but I'll also age poorly in that situation. Take care and have a wonderful night. And remember, six generations from now, your children might be fighting vampires in prison with psychic powers. Bye. <laughs> Bye.